My name is Ashford Hughes Sr. Uh, the last four years I've worked in the mayor's office. I've served as uh, Mayor Barry's senior advisor for workforce diversity and inclusion. Recently for the last two and a half years I served with uh, Mayor Briley as the chief diversity, equity and inclusion officer for the city. Part of your time with the city involved conversations about juvenile crime and, and what to call the situation. Can, can you walk me through this debate over what to call it? Absolutely. Uh, there were points in times in my role looking at how we distribute equitable policies across the city that we sat down with our neighborhood advisor, Lionel Matthews, who is our current juvenile clerk. We've sat down with uh, Judge Calloway, others internal in the mayor's office to look at calling out the situation for what it is. We all see that we have an uptick of African-American men, especially being involved in youth crime, particularly around guns. Uh, and we jostled with, do we call this outright a health crisis? Do we call this a health epidemic to give it the immediate attention that we need, uh, that, that it needs to take? And up until now, we really haven't uh, been able to call it out for what it is, for not having, I guess, in certain times, the correct data to make that a responsible verbiage to use. But I think now, as we continue to see the numbers rise and we see the community being where it is right now, we need to call it a, a health crisis. A health crisis within that community, the African-American community? I think it's a health crisis within the entire city. Well, uh, what affects one artery of the city affects them all. And while we see this as an uptick of crime, particularly in 37208, uh, 37207, we recognize that that has a, positive, a negative effect over all the uh, zip codes within the city. So as a city, for us to firmly address it, it needs to be considered a health crisis. What happens in North Nashville affects what happens in Madison. The problems that affect Madison also affect what happens in the southeast of Davidson County. So this is a crisis of magnitude that represents the entire county. There were some people who were reluctant to call it a public health crisis. I, I think when we talked about uh, someone being reluctant, we wanted to make certain that the mayor framed it in a sense that was uh, empathetic and was not be caused harm from coming from a person that was not of color. Uh, so the hesitancy was around how do we frame this in a manner that we give it, it urgency, it's a sense of urgency, but we don't have it coming from one that may not represent the community, that may be seen as pandering. Uh, we also know that Nashville is only around 40 percent uh, communities of color. So how do we get, how do we work with a, a white mayor to really come out and make that declaration without seeming as though it was demonizing one specific community? So, so it's, it's a conversation that we need to have, but we've postponed because of issues of race. Absolutely. And I believe until we really address the fundamental core root of this situation, this health crisis, I think we're not going to see much change. Where we have been in my time in the mayor's office and where we have been over the last 10 years is I've been in the community working on issues of equity and inclusion. We haven't fully jumped into the race conversation. We haven't jumped into systematic racism, which is what we're dealing with right now. Institutionalized racism around structures is really what we're facing. There were some people who were reluctant to call it a public health emergency or a public health crisis because it might make the city look bad? Uh, we always want to make certain as a city that we are telling the entire story, right? So there were times when I, I believe we were hesitant to make it seem as though the city was moving in a negative manner, that we had um, this crisis that affected everyone. I believe over time, you know, leadership began to see this is a crisis. At the time when I was in the office, at the times that we were coming to the table to bring this up, I think leadership was wanting to see a little more. They were wanting to hear more from the community that the community also said, this is a crisis mode. How do we band and work together? But there was a little bit of a, hey, let's get more information. Let's get more data. Let's get more people around the table to talk about this before we declare it a crisis. What does it matter what we call it? I think what, get me what gets measured gets done. So if we continue to make this seem like a one-off, as if it's only an issue of parental involvement, if it's only an issue of if they were able to read more, if it was only an issue of how do we help keep families together, then we really aren't addressing the systematic core fundamental problem.
The fundamental problem that we see here is institutionalized structural racism, right? Racial policies that have led to this. These kids have dealt with trauma for a long time. Trauma in a lot of matters, housing trauma, being conditioned into living in an area that concentrated poverty is, economic uh, 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 racism. Whenever you have communities that have been torn apart by urban renewal, where businesses and the fabric of economic structure in black communities have been torn about, drama. Uh, generational poverty has occurred over decades and decades of time. These are structures, these are institutionalized racist policies that have kept African Americans in particular now as we go into new Americans and Latinos back. There is evidence, there is data evidence once you de-aggregate the data that shows the numbers of what takes place when those policies have affected African American community members that have led us to this particular moment in time. And examples of institutional racism, for example, development. Absolutely. So right now, when you talk about development in the city, for the most part, if you look at the areas that have been underdeveloped over time, you think North Nashville, you think of the Bordeaux area, you think of Southeast Davidson County. When you look at the areas that we highly invest in, and those communities are they have what in common? Majority African American, majority Latino owned communities. If you look at the places where city investment or where private sector investment has occurred, it's been in downtown Nashville. It's been in the Bellevue area. It's been in Westmead area, predominantly Caucasian areas of town. Development has had a strong factor in how these communities develop and how uh, businesses come and attract people to work for them. We know in Nashville, 60 plus percent of people work for small businesses. We also know that we had to do a disparity study that showed that there was passive discrimination against ethnic minority and women owned businesses. That meant that those businesses were not able to attract access to capital, were not attracting prosperous dollars to be able to give back into the community. You cannot continue to have a community that does not have an economic base and think that these issues of access to uh, capital, uh, access to having quality jobs is not going to have a negative effect over time. And, and development going back decades broke up uh, traditionally uh, African American business communities. Absolutely. So we just look at Interstate 40. We look at where that interstate I interacted with Jefferson Street in North Nashville. You had many a leader uh, back in that time, C.E. Magruder, others, NAACP, fighting to make certain that that interstate did not come through Jefferson Street. You had not only commerce taking place in that street, but you had some of the most foremost uh, uh, legal people, educators living right around that corner where all our historically black colleges and universities are. You put that interstate smack dead in the middle of that community, and now you disrupt the fabric of the commerce, of the economic base. Each community must have an economic base to continue to thrive in a positive manner. You look downtown where the Morris Memorial Building now sits. From the Morris Memorial Building now on MLK uh, Boulevard all the way down 4th Avenue used to be the Black Business District. Because of urban renewal, because the name in the name of new development to spawn new growth, that Black Business District was torn apart. Citizens Bank got its first start in that Morris Memorial Building. Now we have only remnants of what was there, but we don't have the economic backing to support it. And, and then you had that development uh, that broke up neighborhoods and people were herded into housing projects? Absolutely. Again, I continue to talk about systems and structures, right? So we know that urban housing policy was based on a lot of redlining policy that actually put poor African American people in a concentrated area, right? to keep them out of specific surrounding outskirts of the community. Uh, before our metro government consolidated, the majority of African American people in the city lived in the city core. Once that consolidation happened, then it kind of got spursed out. But if you look across the country, and if you look at what took place in Nashville, our urban core became a place for concentrated poverty within these specific housing developments. Within those housing, housing developments, what wasn't there were job training opportunities. There was no economic base, so these folks could still live in this community, but also have commerce that stayed within itself to grow and sustain itself to be prosperous. So now you have people that have been in generational poverty because access to quality jobs weren't there, 
access to better housing wasn't there. And this is based off of public policy. This is not um, just something that came about because developers said we're gonna concentrate there. In the 60s and 70s, that urban housing policy really put redlining at the forefront of how we did and built housing in cities. And then you had mass incarceration policies that uh, disproportionately affected African Americans. I mean, crack cocaine as opposed to powder cocaine being an example. Is there a connection between that and uh, the problems with the families? I think it's all interconnected. And it, again, it goes back to root causes of institutionalized racism. So when you talk about education policy, when you talk about the data that we have to show that youth are getting, black male youth are getting expelled as early as kindergarten, if not before, and the access and the direct pipeline to prison, which that leads to, that is public policy, right? That is public policy that is shaping how our youth are involved in this. You have other policies that uh, dictate that, you know, we try to have a school funding system that is equal, but equal access to funding does not mean equitable outcomes. We know that many of our schools that house a lot of African American students have bad uh, uh, books. They don't have up-to-date curriculum. Some of the schools are falling down right now. And a teacher can only do so much to foster growth and innovation in these type of atmospheres. So we have to look at how do we change that structure and how has that structure and how has that system caused for these students, one, to not be reading at grade level, and two, not have a direct access to pipeline, to workforce opportunities, and to be able to elevate themselves to college. So if we have this community conversation, the result will be uh, a more therapeutic approach to juvenile crime rather than a punitive approach? I think if we start this conversation, the first thing that we can do is acknowledge that our systems and our structures in Nashville, Tennessee have been drawn and been calculated to not be broken, but they are systematically been institutionalized to operate in a racist form and fashion. I mean, I think the numbers speak directly to that when you look at the data and who's been most affected by the disparities. I think the conversation begins with acknowledgement. Right. Once we acknowledge and once we can say this is a public health crisis, once we can say that this is a not a broken uh, uh, promise, but this is a broken system. The system has changed. The system has not changed and is causing this issue. Then we begin to sit down and talk with each other about, OK, you can then see the humanity in these young African-American men and women who are getting in trouble, and these young Hispanic men and women who are getting in trouble. And you can look past the issues, right? You can look past the parental involvement kind of falsehood, and you can look at the system and see what can we begin to do to address that system. Right now in Nashville, it is time, like we have to move beyond the Nashville nice to uh, move to acknowledgement and then look at ways that we can begin to destruct the system, which ways we can begin to uproot the system and make change. But it has to be based off of a long-term strategic process that the city goes through and we have to keep e equity in the forefront and look at how do we shape the policies that are gonna take into consideration these marginalized community members. And just to be clear, you're not talking about giving a pass to any violent offenders. Oh, no, no pass. I think uh, growing up, you know, I've had two friends that have lost their lives to violence, right, to gun violence. And if I knew who was the person that uh, had killed them both, I would ask that they be come to justice, right? I think there is levels of accountability. But I think you also have to look at the entire process and the entire system. And you can't just say, this community is bad. They just need to be better parents. This community is bad. They aren't doing enough. We have to move beyond blaming the victim and look at the systems. Even with these young youth uh, violent people, uh, offenders, there is an opportunity for redemption in their lives. There is an opportunity that they can change if given the full opportunity to do so. But that doesn't mean just allowing them to come out after having making these bad mistakes, putting them in the exact same situation and not providing structural change and opportunities and resources to better themselves. Do you think this community is really ready for this kind of conversation? Whether we're ready or not, I'm hopeful that persons like myself, persons like uh, the people that work at Gideon's Army, 
people like our juvenile court clerk, Lionel Matthews, people like Judge Calloway, will force that conversation. I think now I'm hopeful that the community is ready and willing to take that step forward. Within the mayor's office, we really began to address equity and understanding equity is about fairness and justice. I think now is the time more than ever that the black community especially but also now our brothers and sisters in the brown community, Latino community, are coming together and are working together to bring these issues to the forefront. And I think now is the time that you're going to see us have to, have to call it out for what it is if we want to see change. This is absolutely a public health crisis. This is absolutely something that the city, that the community really needs to take a hold of to acknowledge, work together to embrace this, in dialogue, but then allow those people in the community, allow black and brown people to lead the efforts to work together with equitable distribution of resources to make change so we don't see any more of our young black brothers and sisters getting involved in this youth crime. They're screaming out to us, right? They have been screaming out to us for a while. They need us now to call it out for what it is and then step in as leaders in this city and provide the change that's necessary. If you call it a public health crisis, what does that mean? What, what are three things you would do? I think the first thing that would happen is that the mayor needs to get with the health department leadership. He needs to get all the minority caucus members, and that includes the LGBT caucus members. He needs to get all the African-American state reps, get them in a the table, get all the people that are in this field from Clemmy Greenlee to Gideon's Army to myself and others to really say, I'm going to make now a public statement. That public statement reads as, as the mayor of this city, I value every citizen's life. I value the quality of life that we want to have here in this city. I see that right now we have a public crisis with the uh, incarceration rate, with the deaths of young black and brown men in this city. And I am going to find a way starting today to alleviate and to correct that situation. I think then you sit down with these leaders and begin to assess the data. Where, what does the data tell us? Where does the data lead us, right? And then beyond just having a task force, I think you set up what are the three things that we can do right now to begin to get into these communities to really solve this issue? How do we work with those institutions that are in the community to solve this issue? It goes beyond just looking at the budget, but it says these are the allocutions of dollars that I'm going to make that I'm going to commit to in this budget so that we can start moving this forward. We really have to get with the health department to really get a team together. There's already one form, but get this team back together to really say we're going to start making concrete steps. But step number one is for the mayor in a public setting, in a public viewing, alongside of the MNPS school director to declare a public health crisis for black and brown youth in this city.